and we ask that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes to truth, that your Holy Spirit will lead us in the way of truth, that we will follow the truths of the Word of God, that we will follow the truth of Jesus Christ, that we will follow the truth that is in store for those who seek after thee, because you said, Seek and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open unto you. And we are seeking this afternoon from you, O God, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Well, we're having something different today <laughs> because I have been looking into these things for quite a long time, as you know, uh, in relation to the Scriptures. And it's an ongoing quest because lots of people do it too. You know, on the internet you have the, the King James followers and you have all the other followers and they all put their points. Well, of course, I've heard it all over the years. And considering that we looked at the book of Enoch, that is not in our Bible, it is not in the Roman Catholic Bible, but it's in the Bibles of the East. And the Western Church overlooks the Eastern Church. In an, as a matter of fact, much history is not known about what God did in Asia in the first few hundred years after Christ. For the simple reason that first of all the Mongols came across the whole of Asia, as you know, and went as far as Hungary, actually, and uh, they subdued the peoples, they, they killed them, and they destroyed manuscripts, they destroyed monuments, they destroyed whatever they could find. As bad as ISIS, only worse, if you want to know. <laughs> and uh, after them, there were the Muslims, of course, who went throughout the whole of Asia. And so they did their, their destruction and destroyed the records. But as I said last Sunday, I found a book written by uh, a New Zealand theologian. I don't know whether he was Presbyterian or Baptist, but he had, uh, he had delved into the history of, of Asian Christians through manuscripts that he could find and everything that he could find, and he wrote this book, which I have, telling much of the history of Asia. Well, we in the West know nothing about it. We know the missionary stories. I mean, we've read the missionary books and heard the missionary stories, but they only go from probably the 1700s on. I mean, even William Carey, I think he was only in the early 1800s when he went to India, or he was probably earlier. Uh, we all know about those and what they did, but we don't know the situation of the churches. And so we don't understand that they had something that we don't have. And we take a certain pride which is wrong in the fact that we are the Protestants. We belong to this denomination. We're not Catholics. You know. That attitude's around, it's been around for, for years. And then on top of that, we have this attitude, oh, we know better than the Orthodox churches. Well, as Protestants and Evangelicals, yes, we do know better than the, the Catholic churches. Let's be honest, of course we do. We came out, that we had the Reformation. We do know better than the Orthodox churches because we've had evangelical moves in the last, let's say, 500 years anyway, that they have not had. But in their first thousand years of history, they had something that was missing, certainly missing from the Protestant churches, we didn't exist, and missing from the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church went off into such a a following of Judaism and heathendom in their rites and liturgies that, of course, no decent Protestant would ever want to belong to the Roman Catholic Church. Let's be honest, because we see the Word of God is against a lot of what they did. Of course, let's be honest, the Word of God is against what, just about what everything that goes on in all the denominations. Yeah, let's be honest. And let's be honest with this that the Eastern Orthodox churches had in their Bibles the Apocrypha and the Book of Enoch. Now, the Roman Catholics had the Apocrypha 
in their Bible to this day. And we, of course, look down our noses on them and say, no, it's not right to have the Apocrypha. Now, the, the Apocrypha that they have is 10 books, but the original Apocrypha in the Septuagint was 14 books. And Hillary and I have the Septuagint, and I did count them. I think there's about 10. Uh, I think there's about, um, yeah, I think there's 10. I counted them. Now, this is something we don't know, but before I say that, let me say this. What is our world view when it comes to churches? What we've seen and observed and heard and listened to and followed in our churches all our lives. Now, isn't that a, a fact? That's our world view of Christianity. Every denomination's the same, every church. If you stayed in the same little church in a country town for 50 years and didn't go anywhere else, that would be your world view of Christianity. And if you're in a large denomination and mingle with lots of people, that's your worldview. Everything they do, everything they say, everything they preach, everything they read, we're all tied to a worldview. We should not be tied to a worldview. We should be tied to what God has done in the church. And by that, I mean the Church of Jesus Christ, not any particular denomination. And of course, the church started on the day of Pentecost. And for the first hundred years, the church was different, totally, from what it is today. As we have learned, for a hundred years, they did not believe there was a millennium. For the first hundred years, they didn't believe in an antichrist coming. For the first hundred years, they did not believe this end time theories and myths that we hear in all of our churches, all over the world, followed by hundreds of millions of us Christians, and we all followed it and some of us have come out of it. Now, that doesn't mean to say that people who don't follow what is 100% correct, correct, correct are not going to make heaven. There's one thing that has never altered. One thing alone. The King James Version is altered. Now, the King James advocates say, oh, that it's so 100% perfect that it, it, we just have it. It has altered from publication to publication. I've, I, I've read, all about, read it all. Now, this is something that happened in the first three or four publishings of the original King James Version from 1611 to the next publication, to the next one, to the next one. It included the Apocrypha. Now, most, most of us never heard of that, never thought of it. So, you have to say... Nobody in those first years, maybe 80 years, ever considered it would be the right thing to do to remove the Apocrypha. And we Protestants won't have it. There's something wrong, isn't there? Now, there's one thing that hasn't altered. The Bible alters translation by translation. If you just have to get all the modern translations of the, the Bible to see the slight differences. And some people are so set against the NIV, which I agree with them, really. You know, they reckon it was done by homosexuals. <laughs> I don't know whether it was or not. The message Bible doesn't count. The message Bible is absolutely false. But most translations are fairly similar. But they're different. But there is enough doctrine in any translation of the Bible to get the a grasp of the main doctrines. What we don't get a grasp of is all that God has preserved through writers going back to the time of Enoch. They were preserved, the manuscripts were preserved, what Enoch wrote, what Noah wrote. They wrote them. They've been discovered. They were discovered centuries ago. It's a matter of history. Well, so the Bible has altered over the, the centuries. The first Bibles in the original Hebrew had the Apocrypha and Enoch and quite a few other books. Some books that nobody has today that are mentioned in the Bible, and this will surprise us. Because it surprised me, except that two of the books, I, I remember reading 
uh, in the Old Testament years ago. Oh, yes, it says in the book of so-and-so. Oh, yeah, I remembered reading it. Where is the book? Nobody knows. So it is wrong to say God has looked after his word so well that not a word is wrong and not a word is missing. That is not correct. He has looked after the originals, those old trans, uh, writings of Enoch and all those apoc uh, apocryphal books. He did look after the Greek Septuagint because the original e Hebrew, by the time the Jews were in Babylon, the Hebrew changed. It no longer existed. No manuscripts left at all anywhere in the world beyond, beyond about 250 BC. Well, let's say 150 BC. No manuscripts left whatsoever of the Hebrew originals of the Old Testament, the Apocrypha, and uh, those other books that are missing. None but they were translated into the Greek Septuagint, which, which is the only true uh, uh, translation of the original Old Testament that exists in the world today. And it would not be 100% correct. Let's say it's probably 99.5% correct. It has what is missing from our Bibles. And it has something else that we're going to go into later so you can see all that has changed, but something has never changed. Even the New Testament is not, is not the same as, as when it was written. It's not the same because the evil Masoretic Jews got their fingers into the pie and they, they influenced the early writers, uh, the early translators, sorry, Jeremy, about 250 AD, went to Jerusalem and he produced the Latin Vulgate, which in some ways is a better uh, background than, than all the others. So there is differences, but there's something that never changed. Even the name of God, even the name of God is wrongly written in the King James Version. Six, uh, about 6,750 times. It's wrong. It's wrong, and we'll prove it later. But there's something, one thing, that has never altered the name of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? The name of Jesus. Now, there are people going around today in Christian circles. I get them in uh, uh, Facebook. I get them in our uh, YouTube. And they say, oh, Jesh Yeshua bless you. Jehovah bless you. I wrote to one uh, ev evangelist who was doing all this and, and told her, not in public, privately, how evil those words were. And uh, she doesn't mention them anymore. She just says, the Lord bless you, which, of course, is the Bible way. So the name of Jesus is altered by those evil people who call themselves Hebrew followers, Jew lovers, Israelites, Messianic Jews, they've altered the precious name of Jesus to the name of demonic gods. But in the, in the Greek-based New Testament, and I've looked it up, his name is I. Let me go to this Bible. I have to go to this Bible. I've got it written all over the place. Uh, I can't remember, you know. Okay, I read it here in this New Testament. His name in the original Greek is I-E-S-O-U-N or I-E-S-O-U-S. -E Any scholar worth his salt would tell you that. And a lot of scholars aren't worth their salt. Now, Strong's Concordance says, and for once Strong is right, because Strong follows the Masoretic Jews. But he says this, I-E-S-O-U-N is from Soterion. And of course, if you know enough Greek, you'll know it is. You've heard of Soter. You've heard of Soterion. If you've heard anybody speaking a little Greek in relation to the Bible, it means salvation. 
salvation. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of salvation and he was given the name that is above all names that at the name of Jesus, and this is in Philippians 2, at the name of Jesus, Jesus, because I-E-S-O-U-S is translated correctly into English, J-E-S-U-S. At the name of Jesus. And in the original, it doesn't say Yeshua, no apostle, no disciple, and Jesus Christ himself never pronounced the evil word Yeshua, Jesus. What does Peter say in Acts 4? I think it is. Yeah, Acts four sixteen, At the healing of the lame man who sat at the gate beautiful. And, and he, he was begging. And Peter and James were there. And Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, such as I have give I you, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus, who is the embodiment of salvation, not by the name of Jesus. The witchcraft people use Jehovah as by Jehovah, and they do all witchcraft. They use the name Yeshua. Now, you can find this if you look on the internet uh, if you don't believe what I'm saying. Believe you me, when I tell you something, I have researched it thoroughly and 99.9% .9 of the times I will give it to you right. I, I, I'm not infallible, so I can't claim absolute perfection. I will not give it to you wrong. I will give it to you right. Because I think it's absolutely wonderful what the Lord is revealing to us. And then it says in, in Romans 10, I think it's verse 16, you know, Romans 10 and 9, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Then it goes down a few verses and says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is the Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. What is his name? Jesus. As the angel said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now for years, and I sadly have preached this kind of thing, even last year, it's on some of my YouTube, and I have to confront people and tell them and say, look, I was wrong. I have been discovering things. It's wrong. Because I followed everybody else, naturally. I was told that in the King James Version, every Lord, capital L, a capital O, a capital R, a capital D, stands for Jehovah, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, Y-H-W-E-H. That's an absolute lie. A lie out of the pit of hell. And we have been deceived by Satan. Now, that shouldn't upset us. The only way it will upset us is if we follow this ingrained idea that when God gave the revelation of the Word of God, that is His revelation to man, that as we've heard is His love letter to us, which it is, which, which is His Word. And in the original, it's infallible. Nothing wrong. It's only in the translations that fallibility comes across because who's translating? Now you take the translators of the King James Version. I think there's 54 or something like that. Barely out of the Roman Catholic Church. So what do you think they had in the bottom of their hearts? Roman Catholicism. They hadn't left it because most of them, though there were some Puritans, who were similar to the Presbyterians. But many of them were, by then, Church of England. The Church of England never did leave the liturgy of the Roman Catholic Church. And in fact, in, a, in Queensland, uh, uh, you know, I knew this years ago that the Anglicans in Queensland are high church. 
verging on to uh, Roman Catholicism in their liturg liturgies. And so you have people translating who are not divinely inspired by God. Where does the Bible say that he's going to give translators who will be divinely inspired? Nowhere. We, people think they are. They are not. Look, I, I, I've had an Indonesian Bible. I mean, I speak Indonesian. And I wrote to the uh, Foreign and Bible Society because I could see errors. And I wrote and told them in Singapore, I, I was in Indonesia, they sent me a letter back. They said, yes, we know those errors are there. Now, that's the infallible word of God in the original. Now, the errors weren't too bad. I tell you a bad error. They called God Allah, who is the God of demons and the God of is Islam. And of course, they, I said, oh, Allah. They said, yes, that's the Arabic name. They should never have used Allah. Allah. It's, so it's hundreds of times, thousands of times, they got this demonic name throughout the Indonesian Bible. Now we come to the Indian Bible. We, we were vis I, I had to pray. A couple of times I've, I, I've preached at their little uh, services at the British and Foreign Bible Societies and in different places. And uh, we were in one place and I told them about the Tamil Bible. And I said, you know, it's got this such and such an error. You know what they said? Yes, we know. Now, they, the Br British and Bi Foreign Bible Society, wow, thank God we've had them. Dear me, how many nations have got the Bible in their language? And they wouldn't have had it without the British and Foreign Bible Society starting off and doing it. But you see, people are, are fallible, make mistakes. But there's not a mistake. And this is amazing to me. You know, I, I was taught years ago that God pre so prepared the world through the Roman Empire for Jesus Christ that the gospel could go everywhere because the Romans went everywhere, even in England, building roads. Pe the people of the Roman Empire went everywhere. They traded, they did everything. And uh, you know that the, the nation of uh, Israel was prepared for the birth of Jesus Christ. The Romans even had uh, a census. We need, read this in the, in the Gospels. So that at the time of the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem because it says in the Old Testament of Bethlehem of Ephrata. And what about King Herod the Great? who reigned until 4 AD and was still there when Jesus was three or four years old. And remember how it is said in the Old Testament, great shall be the weeping of, uh, in Ramah. And it happened. How did it happen? Because that cruel king was there. That cruel king who was an Edomite and who wasn't a true is Hebrew, and who really didn't love God and didn't serve God, but he knew, they all knew, it was about the time, according to Daniel 9, um, 20, 24 to 27, when G, the Messiah should be born, they knew, and you know the story, the wise men came from the east and said to Herod, they said, and Herod heard, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Well, that's no good for Herod. He's, he's got a rival. So he, he says to them, you go and find out and let me know. So what happens when the child is such and such an age? As the scriptures had foretold, Joseph and Mary go off to Egypt to be out of the way when Herod had all the babies killed. All the babies under two, I think it was, killed. God had prepared the whole scene for the coming of Jesus Christ, for the birth of Jesus Christ. And he prepared the scene also that included this fact that everyone all over the whole of the Roman Empire was required to speak Greek. 
That was their language. It was not Latin. It was not Aramaic, as I have even wrongly said on one or two occasions. Because I follow the theologians, you know, until you find out differently and find they're all wrong. Because you know what the theologians do in all their seminaries, especially in USA, where there have been millions of scholars in the, the uh, seminaries to this day, and some around Australia. They follow what all the others say. You want a degree? You have to write a thesis that that uh, the 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 uh, that the uh, examiners of, of the of the university are happy with. That aligns with their beliefs. Would anybody who went into a university and wrote a thesis against evolution get a, get a degree? No. So what do the, all the scholars do? They want their degrees more than anything else because they're so proud, you know. They want a degree. So they write what is, and believe what is taught in the main. So this has happened with all the Christians. They just believe most of the things they're taught in seminary. Then they go outside of it. Now, I downloaded a couple of weeks ago a thesis by a Baptist of USA, and he said this. He said, I got A's in every subject, but when I did this thesis, I got a D. Because he was writing things about the King James Version that was disagreeable to his university, but they didn't dare fail him because he had all those A's. They gave him a D. So he put it on the internet and I downloaded it. So that's what they do. So don't be surprised that things do go astray uh, because they do. Well, now here is something else I want to say, seeing I've got it all written here. Um, because the, uh, it is a sad thing that in the churches, and I don't know what denominations include this, you see the, uh, <clears throat> the Jewish signs all around, the uh, star, uh, si uh, what do they call it, the sign of David, the everything, the, the, the candlesticks, everything. You go into certain churches, you see these things. They preach it because they love what the Jews are saying. Now, this is what the Jews are saying, even the Messianic Jews. They want us all to say Yeshua. H have you met them in the churches? Because they're around. And uh, Yesha. Oh, they love to say it. And they've got a lot of church people saying it. But I want to tell you that those words Yeshua and Yeshua have this meaning. May his name be obliterated. Talking about Jesus Christ. These people think they're talking a good word about Jesus Christ. They're talking a curse word. They're talking a, a witchcraft word. And while we're talking about that kind of thing, the same thing applies to the word Jehovah. Now, there's a psalm that says, Thou shalt call his name... Uh, what's it say? He rides upon the winds or something by his name Jah. J-A-H. Yeah. Now, in the, in the Septuagint, it doesn't say Jah at all. It says Lord. Thus God, has God given us a name that he bears? No. You can't think of one. Forget Jehovah, because it's not written. Jehovah's not written in our Bibles. It's Lord. Somehow or other, somebody might have got the picture. They did write that. But in the Septuagint, it's Lord. Because in Exodus 3 and Exodus 16, so when Moses said to God, who said to him, I want you to go to the children of Israel and tell them that I have sent you, excuse me, sent you. And remember the story? This was at the time when the, Moses saw the burning bush. And, and out of the bush, a voice spoke. The voice was the angel of the Lord, Christ himself. And in some ways, God's there. Christ is God. 
but you know, we know that he's Trinity. And so what does God say? And God incidentally in the, uh, in the original is not, is not Adonai, it's not Elohim, it's not Jehovah, it's not Jehovah Jireh, it's not Jehovah Shalom, it's not Jehovah Rapha, it's not Jehovah Ra, it's not Jehovah Zidkenu, and I think there's another one that I forget. Jehovah Shammah, not there. The evil, demon, demonic word. So Satan has deceived the church. Now didn't the Apostle Paul say, be careful, he said, like, watch, consider Eve. She was taken away by the de deceptor, it's in, it, it, deceiver. It's in, uh, it's in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And doesn't Paul say we are not ignorant of his devices? Paul knew all about the devices. He'd been snared by them in his non-Christian state. He was a Talmudic Pharisee who followed the Babylonian gods that are mentioned in Ezekiel 8, where God said to Ezekiel, go and look at the temple in Jerusalem in vision, open the door down below. They're worshipping gods underneath the temple. And they, and what about all the sayings that Jesus said in the four Gospels? You have your own traditions. You're not following Moses. You're not following God. How many times did he say that? And didn't he say to them, you're a den of vipers? And didn't he say to them, you travel uh, sea and land to make, a, to make a convert? And you make him how many times more the child of hell, he said, than you were. Poor Saul was a child of hell. He was a Pharisee, remember? He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was one of the leaders a young one in Jerusalem. And when uh, Stephen was martyred and they threw stones at him, remember at the end of the chapter it says, and they went and laid Stephen's clothes at the feet of a young man called Saul. Saul was a prominent up-and-coming Pharisee, a rich man, evil. He knew all about those, the wives of the devil. He'd been snared in them all his life until he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And most Pharisees and Jews who follow the Talmud will never meet Jesus Christ because they're the seed of Satan. But so Paul knew, and this is what I love about Paul, and I don't think Paul's the only one who has to say that. I, I, I have to say it myself, even though I was never a Talmudic <laughs> or a Jew. He said, I am the greatest of sinners. What else can you say about yourself? Well, maybe he had more of a case for saying it than I did. He, he persecuted the Lord's people. But nevertheless, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But anyway, those names exist. They are Yah, Yeshua, Y-H-W-H, uh, and Y-H, uh, y, Y-W-H is, no, which one is from, uh, yeah. One of them is Yah, and it is the moon god or Allah, the god of the Muslims. Now, Islam is a stepdaughter of Judaism. So is the Roman Catholic Church. So this is what people are saying uh, without knowing it. Look, I preached about Jehovah. I remember years ago in India, India we were at a certain Bible school and I taught the students about all the names of God, Jehovah. Well, they thought it was wonderful. And I, in my ignorance, thought they were wonderful too. They're absolute lies. And so, having said that, we'll get to something else. And I'm going to read from manuscripts because obviously 
I have not discovered all these things by going to seminaries in universities and manuscripts all over e uh, Europe and USA, obviously. You have to rely on the reports of scholars and you have to rely on the fact that different scholars are saying such and such a thing, but this is the thing. What is their proof? You can't accept anything on hearsay. You have to have the proof. Now, if you will bear with me, uh, I will just say uh, some of these things so you get the picture. But this is a, a good thing I'm saying first. God's name is Ahaya I am, as he said in Exodus 3, 14 and 15. But that would not be in the original manuscript because I think that is Paleo-Hebrew from the Babylonians. This is what this writer says because he's a follower of that. He's telling you all about that. He said the name Yahweh, Y-H-V-H, was injected into the text of the Old Testament by the others, by the Pharisees and others who practiced Babylonian Satanism. The precursor to Kabbalism and Talmudism that the, all the Jews in the whole world follow today. If they don't follow it diligently and they go to the synagogue, they follow the rabbis who teach it. I was telling you, my doctor, whose grandmother is a Jew, and he and I have been discussing Christian things every time I go to him, which is the past few years, on and off. And uh, he, 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 he went to America. At one stage he was married to a very brilliant woman there. I don't think she was a Jewess. That he's interested in Jewry. His grandmother's a Jew. His father's an Anglican. He's an Anglican. So he said to me uh, about two months ago, Oh, he said, I went to the, I, I went to, I was, I was a doctor in the Jewish hospital. What's it called? Uh, anyway, and he met two famous Jews who were doctors and, and uh, psychiatrists. And you know what he said? They are so evil. Now, this is a doctor. But he went to the synagogue. He sent, I went to the New York synagogue. And he said, you know what they're teaching? the Kabbalah and the Talmud. The Talmud said, Jesus Christ is in hell boiling in excrement. I don't often like say that. I don't like even to repeat it. We downloaded a lot of the Talmud. That's translated into English, I think it was in 1905. Of course, it's in uh, Yiddish. It's not in, in proper Hebrew. And we downloaded it. We got to so far, we wouldn't download any rest, any, any of the rest. There's the whole library of it. It is the most evil, pornographic, satanic, magic, I don't know what else to say, book you could ever find. There is another one, another book, that has a slight comparison to it. And it's a book written by Alistair Crowley, you may not have heard of him. I, I just know these things from the internet, you know. And of course, I've been searching the internet for years. And he is the most famous Satanist in the, that the English know and the Americans know. Everybody who's a Satanist knows about him. And he wrote a book. And he talks about this, about Jehovah and so on. Like, the, actually, here it is here. The infamous Kabbalistic and Kabbalist and Satanist Alistair Crowley writes, There are thus 72 angels. These names are derived from the great name of God. The name is Tetragrammaton. I-H-V-H, he says, commonly called Jehovah. He is the supreme Lord of the whole universe, the book of Thoth. Don't be mistaken into thinking he's talking about our God. He's talking about Satan. He's talking about the satanic gods, G-O-D-S. 
And he wrote the book of Thoth. T-H-O-T-H. Do you want, can I say it? Now, this is funny. Yesterday, wasn't it? Russell's walking along the passageway. Now, he says he's never heard of the... He, see, he hasn't read this. Have you read this? Yeah. Have you read this? Only nothing. No. Writings. <laughs> I got a whole pile. Nobody in the whole house has read them except me. But Russell, yeah, goes along when he hears most uh, generally. He didn't go along with this about Jehovah. He wouldn't accept what I said. But now he does. Can you believe it? He's walking along the passageway and if something comes to his mind. Thoth, thoth, thoth. And you get a terrible feeling, right? Now he'd never heard of Thoth, neither had I. And lo and behold, he looks it up on the internet. And what was it? Thoth was what? Oh, it's, a, it's the Egyptian god. What? It's Egyptian? The Egyptian god. An right. Egyptian god. The Egyptian god of wisdom, yeah. that, is, that is similar to Jehovah. Now, the primary one of the 54 sacred names in the Jewish Kabbalah, which is the Jewish magic book that my doctor saw being taught in the synagogue in New York of these supposed people of God. Look, the Church of America and Australia is absolutely deceived by Satan in calling the Jews of Israel the people of God. They're evil. They would not teach these books. They've been teaching them for centuries. And he says, uh, the infamous Kabbalist and Satanist, Alistair Crowley, I've read that, of the 54 sacred names in the Jewish Kabbalah, he says, no, somebody else says this, the primary one is Yahweh. Y-H-W-H. Is that the sacred name of God or blasphemy? It's blasphemy. Never say Jehovah again. If you're in a church where the preacher's all the time preaching about Jehovah, get up and walk out in protest. Now, of course, we didn't know this. I didn't know this. I've got yet Jehovah on my YouTubes last year. And so I had to turn around and when I preach the truth, I say I was wrong because I followed everybody else. So the secret of the ancient Egyptians and their modern disciples, the Freemasons, is the art of demonology for gaining power, and this is what the Jews are doing throughout the world, mainly through the devil, Jehovah. Now you will never say Jehovah again, will you? Or Yahweh, or treat it as holy. But you see, God does not have a name. He's above names. He said, I am that I am. I in me, he's saying, all existence is. He's saying, I am. He is. He doesn't need a name. How could a heavenly name of God get into our minds? Impossible. Because the name of Jesus isn't heavenly. It's earthly. It's Greek translated into English. But in that name is all power because it talks of the one who is the embodiment of salvation, Jesus Christ. See, God would not let, let anything happen to the name of Jesus because by the name of Jesus we are saved. And by the name of Jesus we will be bowing down and worshipping him at the name of Jesus, it says, every knee shall bow. Not at the name of Yeshua. Oh, God forbid. I don't know why I said it in the same context. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord, Lord to the glory of God the Father. And as we said last week from the book of Revelation, it says he is King of kings and Lord of lords. All holy, all perfect, all righteous. And because we dealt with the book of Enoch uh, through the week, I'll go back to this. 
Enoch, when you read it, it's full of gospel sayings. The book of, the book of Proverbs isn't. Our book of Proverbs isn't. But the book of Proverbs has this wonderful thing, and especially in the Septuagint, and I think the King James is different, Keith. It's Proverbs chapter 30, and it says in, at the end of verse 4. So what is his name, you see? This is about God. And what is his son's name? Well, we know his son's name. But there's a verse in the Old Testament that should show all the Hebrews that God is just not one. He's also, there is the son. Who is his son? And apart from that and the fact that he is wisdom, there's not much about the gospel in the book of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes or, or the book of Ruth. How do you think? Or the Song of Solomon, except, of course, we see that as, as, as Christ in his church. But in the book of Enoch, it's full of gospel sayings that were given to Enoch. This is wonderful about Enoch, as it says in Genesis, uh, Genesis 5. Enoch walked with God and was translated. It says in the King James, and was not, because God took him. Now, all my church life I've heard, that's a type of the translation. When the Lord comes, when all the saints go to heaven, it is only a type. What saints go to heaven, though? Those who are made righteous in Christ. What kind of a person was Noah? A preacher of righteousness full of righteousness, as we said. So full of Christ's righteousness that Christ walked in him for 120 years when he was preaching to the people on earth then who were so wicked and vile. You and I could never imagine how vile they were. If you've lived in a heathen country or heard stories of people, some people out in the world or God forbid you never watch the evil things on television, you would have some idea of the evil. Enoch li uh, lived amongst it. And as we found out from uh, First, Peter, First Peter chapter 3 and Second Peter chapter 2, that Christ went and preached to those people because he was in Christ, in Noah, the preach, a preacher of righteousness. Christ was in him all the time. Noah, Noah lived righteously before God until after the flood when Christ had left him. See, Christ wasn't there preaching anymore, was he? So Noah went into, he got drunk and had kind of sexuality because of his drunkenness. Christ had left him, yet before that, he had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, do not think he did something to find grace, no. He had found grace in the eyes of the Lord because God had put grace inside of him. By grace we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So here is, is, is the Enoch walking with God. It doesn't say God walked with him. God didn't come down to walk with him. Like God came down to the Garden of Eden. And he said, if you remember, Adam and Eve, where are you? They said, oh, we're naked. We're afraid. See, God had come down. God did not come down to Enoch. Enoch was up there half the time walking with God. How do you think he was walking with God? Seeing into heaven. Seeing visions and dreams of things unimaginable that nobody has ever seen before or since. Not even the Apostle Paul. But then on the other hand, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 10 or 11, he said, I know a man in Christ, and of course it was himself, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. He did not know whether his body went there or just his spirit. He just didn't know. But he was there and he said, I saw things that are unutterable, that cannot be uttered and cannot be talked about. But you see, Enoch saw things that were to be written. He wrote them because he was up there walking with God. And there's a revelation from God in the book of Enoch that is absolutely superb. Now, why hasn't it been in our Bibles? Well, I'll tell you. To start off with, the Jew, evil Masoretic Jews did a, did a deal with the Roman Catholic Church in the, uh, about 400 AD they did not want the book of Enoch, and I'll tell you why. They didn't like, of course the Jews didn't want it, because the book of Enoch shows so clearly Jesus Christ, it mentions the Messiah, it so shows, shows so clearly more than any book we've got in the, in the whole Bible that we have. It shows more clearly the wonders of Jesus Christ. Of course, the Jews didn't want that. And the Catholics didn't want it. You know why? Because when you read the book of Enoch, you have to say there's no place for a pope or hierarchy. The pope is Jesus Christ on earth. Did you know that? Yeah. So you see, the Catholics didn't want that, and neither did the Jews, so they eliminated the book of Enoch. And of course, the Protestants just went along Let's face it, the Protestants followed what the Catholics did. We got the same manuscripts and, and similar things, uh, altered it a bit. We followed what they did. So, we're not as pure as what we think we are. But you know, the salvation doesn't rest, rest on that. Salvation rests on what Christ did for us on the cross. Salvation rests on the fact whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation rests upon the fact he who endures to the end shall be saved. And I don't believe that all the multitudes who come forward to accept Christ will make heaven. They will not endure to the end. And how real is their acceptance? And particularly, as, as this friend of yours from America said, um, Hillsong has, has, dis, has spoiled the Christian church's music. Now, he's American. Now, I'll say this for Americans because I've been there more than once. And uh, if there's any musicians on earth, it's found in USA. They're not found, most of them. What we have in Australia doesn't compare. The church music of USA, and I don't go along with church music anymore, as you know, but I walked into a church in USA that was the Church of the Nazarene and we sang the hymn. The whole church sings in four parts. Now this isn't a choir, this is just ordinary people. You wouldn't get a church like that in the whole of Australia. And your friend said, Hillsong music has spoiled Christian music. He's right. But not only has Hillsong music spoiled Christian music, Hillsong, Hillsong uh, teaching has spoiled Christianity. Now, Hillsong is Assemblies of God of Pentecostal. I was Assemblies of God Pentecostal. And I dare to say, and know to say, and will say, and am not to shame to say, shame to say, even though I was Assemblies of God, as, as Brian Houston still is, but calls themselves, what do they call themselves now? whatever it is, ACT or whatever it is, Australian Christian churches. They're, they're assemblies of God. His father's assemblies of God. Assemblies of God, as I am. And I want to tell you, they are not preaching the gospel that I heard in the assemblies of God, well, 50, 50 years ago, 60 years, 55 years ago, not preaching it. The demonic has come in. Now this is church. The doctrines of demons. So what does this tell us? 
do what that hymn said. Fight the good fight of faith, said Paul to Peter, Timothy. What's the good fight of faith? All the truth of the gospel in the New Testament. Despite it being not a perfect translation, the truth of the gospel that we need to know is in the New Testament and not in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. It's the New Covenant. So we have to search for the truth of the gospel by looking at its pages, by reading it day after day, year after year, month after month, filling our hearts with what the gospel is teaching in the New Testament. Then when we hear something from the pulpit that's wrong, the Spirit of God will speak to our hearts and bring to our minds a certain scripture if we're walking with God. But I have to say, I sat in churches for years. I would know things were wrong, but I have to say the Spirit of God didn't tell me every sermon I had what was wrong. And I used to read the Bible. It's been a process. Because we're growing, every one of us. If we're in Christ, we're growing. We're all at different stages. But we all need to fill our hearts with the words of the truth of the gospel. And if we find out from the internet after research that what certain people and stu uh, scholars are saying, let's follow what they say. Doesn't matter what the rest of the people do. I often think of Noah, actually. One man preaching to all those maybe millions of people. One man for 120 years. Okay, his three daughters and his wife and his three sons-in-law they went into the ark because God wanted to save them. But they didn't do any preaching. We don't know what kind of lives they had. Now, do we? But Noah did the preaching. One man. They must have scoffed at him and mocked him. He kept going alone. And we used to sing in a Sunday school, Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Let's be Daniels. Dare to stand alone for Christ. Because he said that he who confesses me before men, he who denies me, we cannot deny the Christ of the Gospels. Whatever area of truth is shown to us, it comes from Christ and we have to follow it or we are denying the Christ of the Gospel. So let's take this all to heart. Amen.